Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our Kinostics webinar, Navigating Through the IVDR Directive and Utilising Kinostics Within the Molecular Laboratory. All questions are welcome during the webinar or at the end of the webinar in the questions and answers section, which will be hosted by Kinostics. To avoid any disturbances during the webinar, please write your questions in the comments box or raise your hand on Teams. Part one of the webinar will be presented by Randox Molecular Product Specialist Heidi Dowswell and will cover an introduction to the new IVDR regulations. Heidi is our European Molecular Product Specialist with previous experience in technical support and regulatory affairs. During the initial stages of the pandemic, Heidi was involved in setting up our own COVID-19 laboratory here at Randox. Part two will be focusing on Qnostics controls, featuring a Qnostics case study from our own COVID-19 laboratory. During part three of the webinar, our guest speaker from MBS will present a valuable case study showcasing the validation of a direct PCR machine utilising the Qnostics SARS-CoV-2 analytical Q-panel. Molecular Biology Systems is a life science solution company based in the Netherlands and was founded back in 2015. Their next-gen PCR thermocycler uses patented heating and cooling technology to reduce PCR amplification cycles from hours to minutes. These technological advances are intended to support laboratories across the life science market by reducing costs and accelerating results. Robin Strike is a senior scientist in the research and development team at MBS. Robin has previous experience in molecular diagnostics with main areas of expertise in oncology from his bachelor's and master's degree, and he also has a PhD in reproductive biology. Robin focuses on optimization and validation of molecular biology systems in SARS-CoV-2 detection chemistry with future plans of developing new assays for their ultra-fast PCR thermocycler. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the webinar hosted by Alistair Ricketts, the technical director of Kinostics. All questions can be added to the comments box or if you raise your hand, we will be able to unmute your mic and let you ask your question. To begin, I just want to introduce Randox in case anyone is not already familiar with us. Randox are a world leader in the in vitro diagnostics industry with nearly 40 years experience. Randox products offer clinicians and physicians the most comprehensive insight into patient diagnosis, along for more effective disease management and treatment. Randox was founded back in 1982 by Dr. Peter Fitzgerald and is based in Northern Ireland in the UK. From small beginnings, our products are now used within 145 countries in over 100,000 end user laboratories. Here at Randox, we have a very large focus on innovative products and we commit over 25% of our turnover each year back into research and development. <laughs> Back in February 2020, we built a molecular laboratory in our Randox Science Park in response to the growing need for COVID testing in the UK. We currently have the capacity to test over 500,000 patient samples per day with additional testing in satellite laboratories across the UK. We have conducted approximately 20% of all coronavirus tests performed by our National Health Service. This is over 19 million COVID samples to date. I will now pass over to my colleague Heidi, who will begin the webinar. Thank you, Bryony. Um, so yeah, as she mentioned, I'm going to be discussing the new IVDR directive. Um, that's the aim of this presentation. It's going to come into effect in May 2022. I'm also going to be discussing the importance of the party molecular controls and provide examples on how to incorporate a variety of Qnostic panels into laboratories testing for SARS-CoV-2. So what is the new IVDR? The IVDR on the 5th of May 2017, the Regulation for Medical Devices and In vitro Diagnostic Regulations were published in the European Official Journal. They became effective on the 26th of May 2017. This IVDR is due to be applicable after a transition period of five years, making it applicable on the 26th of May 2022. Therefore, on the lead up to this date, there's been increasing conversations surrounding these new regulations and what impacts they will have on laboratories. This new EU framework will replace the existing regulations for medical devices that were issued in the 1990s, including the Directive on Medical Devices, the Directive on Active Implantable Medical Devices, and the Directive on In Vitro Diagnostic Medical Devices. 
So why did it come into effect? The IVDR was a response to public scandals regarding implanted medical devices. Two of the main examples I'm going to highlight are regarding hip prosthetics and breast implants. So to start with breast implants, in 2009, concerns surfaced after surgeons in France started reporting abnormally high levels of ruptures. One specific manufacturer was found to be using industrial grade silicone, not approved for medical use. When compromised, this gel was known to cause scarring and inflammation. And then for hip prosthetics, there's been thousands of lawsuits throughout the years in relation to metal on metal hip replacements. And this is due to corrosion in the prosthetic. It has led to toxic particles from the metal being released into the body, causing the following side effects, such as memory loss, necrotic tissue and allergic reactions. So what are the main differences between this new IVDR and the pre-existing IVDD? The most important thing to take away from this is that no existing requirements from the IVDD have been removed. However, the IVDR adds new additional requirements. So previously, the IVDD would require a self-declaration <coughs> from a manufacturer to confirm good manufacturing practice. However, this is now being updated to include conformity assessment by notified bodies, allowing increased monitoring by national competent authorities. Um, IVD manufacturers will have to submit scientific validity, clinical performance and analytical performance data when submitting their products for approval by their notified body. So this is in the format of performance evaluation reporting. So when registering new products, manufacturers will have to submit this performance report. This allows scientific allows assessment of scientific validity, analytical and clinical performance to verify conformity and performance requirements. This report is split into the following three sections. So scientific validity report. So this is looking at data, analyzing how the analyte is linked to a specific clinical condition, and it requires demonstration that the link between the product and the intended use. We then have the analytical performance report. So performance data required to meet the intended use. This is in the format of sensitivity and specificity data, for example. It also shows the ability to detect the analyte well enough to give accurate and consistent results. And then finally, clinical performance reports. So the results generated can be correlated to the disease state in the current population. This is evidence to support the product is suitable for the intended users. The shift from self-certification to notified body approval has also brought in a new class system for the IVDR. This means that in order to comply with these new regulations, manufacturers must classify their IVD products according to the rules set out in Annex X. So the um, it's split into three in four different categories. So class A is the lowest risk. This would include things like um, laboratory devices, instruments and consumables, and these can be self certified by the manufacturer. Class B includes devices that present low levels of risk to patients and population than devices in classes C and D. And detection of cholesterol, glucose, bacteria, leukocytes, erythrocytes in your line. Then we're moving on to class C and D, which are our higher risk classes. So class C includes products where the situations of misdiagnosis could potentially be life threatening. This would include um, products relating to testing for infectious diseases and cancer biomarkers, as well as the detection of sexually transmitted infections. These technical files will have to be reviewed by the notified body on a yearly basis um, to assess performance claims. And then on to class D, which is for our highest risk products. These are usually associated with life threatening conditions, transmissible agents in the blood, blood components, cells, tissues and organs. These devices will be intended to be used to assess suitability for transfusion and transplantation. These technical files are reviewed by the notified bodies through un unannounced visits to ensure performance claims are met. So in comparison to the IVDD, the new IVDR has added emphasis on the life cycle of products and continuous evaluation. And this is due to new post-market performance follow-up reports. 
These reports strengthen the requirement for reporting of scientific, clinical and analytical validity for devices, and manufacturers will now have to submit their products for re-evaluation every single year. The aim of these reports is to answer um, questions such as, is the quality of the product consistent over time? Is this product still fit for use? And is there still a requirement for this product in the market? It's ensuring that only the best possible products um, that are the most consistent and reliable are consistently um, available on the market. And then as well, approved products will also be present on a new database called the European Database on Medical Devices, also known as Udemed. This allows consumers to view a living picture of the life cycle of medical devices available in the EU. And the main aims of this database are to enhance transparency, increase access to information for public and healthcare professionals, and improve coordination between different EU member states. So what does this mean for laboratories? So after May 25th, 2022, the IVD regulation will be the only route to conformity for CE marking and subsequent sale in Europe. This is to allow improved consistency in the IVD products on the market, to give added assurance that manufacturers are being responsible with the quality of the market, to help increase transparency in the in vitro diagnostics market. It also um, gives confidence to consumers that results generated by these products can be trusted with confidence and this gives improved clinical decision making. Also, what this means for laboratories is the arrival of the IVDR is encouraging laboratories to implement a rigorous quality management system such as ISO 15189 or equivalent. The below is an excerpt from one ISO 15189 stating that laboratories should ensure that all commercial and in-house tests have been validated and shown to be fit for purpose. Laboratories should participate in an EQA scheme and undertake relevant internal quality control procedures. This can be in the form of using a third party quality control material, such as the Qnostics third party um, product range, which I'm now going to provide a little bit of information on. So what we are finding um, with molecular laboratories is there's a large conversation about quality control and quality assessment, very similar to clinical chemistry labs. We're finding that molecular labs are needing to follow similar regulatory requirements to that of clinical chemistry laboratories. So what does this mean? Internationally, there's increasing regulatory demands on molecular laboratories to achieve um, quality accreditation under ISO 15189 ISO 17025 or equivalent. There's an increased pressure to perform to high standards or risk the consequence of failure. And for those laboratories that have already gained this standard, there's a big risk of non-conformance at the next accreditation audit if poor implementation on quality control is carried on. And if this is consistently happening, there's potential loss of accreditation or certification in some countries. So there's a massive variation in quality control practices in molecular laboratories. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of examples. Many laboratories are still using um, controls provided with the kit or built in cartridge controls in the form of PCR controls and also um, integrated cartridges in kit or built in controls. Alone, however, are not sufficient to measure accuracy and precision, determine lot to lot variation assess genetic diversity and linearity, detect any shifts or drifts. They're not whole pathogen controls usually, so they're not able to ensure accuracy of the entire testing process. They're usually only a process control, such as a PCR control, and they can't also assess specificity. As well, instead of commercial solutions, in some cases, laboratories can also make their own QC material using patient pools. The main issue with patient pooled samples is that they're uncharacterized as the raw material of the samples is constantly changing. These controls will not meet ISO standards, nor are they traceable to any international reference material, such as the WHO reference materials. On the other hand, we have true third party controls, which is what Qnostics is. These have been manufactured independently as per recommendations by ISO or equivalent. So to define third party controls, 
These are independent and third party control materials that have not been designed or optimized for use with any instrument, kit or method. Because of this independence, it enables the QC material to closely mirror the performance of patient samples. By doing so, it will provide an unbiased, independent assessment of analytical performance across multiple platforms. So the QNOSTICS range of third party controls cover an extensive range of infectious diseases. Our products range from transplant associated diseases, respiratory diseases, bloodborne viruses, sexually transmitted infections, central nervous system and gastrointestinal diseases. And we include virology, bacteriology, fungal and parasitic targets. These controls are specifically designed for nucleic acid based testing methods. The main benefits of QNOSTICS, their whole pathogen controls. So we've inactivated the virus and that is what's inside of the vial. This means that they're designed to mimic the performance of patient samples and are capable of assessing the entire testing process from extraction, amplification and detection. Because of this, they can help laboratories meet regulatory requirements in line with ISO 15189. They're liquid frozen controls, so they're convenient and easy to use. No additional preparation is required by the laboratory. They just need to defrost them prior to running them on their machine. We also have a high level of traceability as our controls are traceable to WHO standards and characterized by digital PCR. And because of the wide range of products that we offer, this means that there's a large amount of flexibility associated with these controls, meaning that they're suitable for use with commercial and in-house molecular methods for daily run QC and validation purposes. And they're also very high quality as they're manufactured to ISO 13485 quality standards and a large variety of our products are CE marked. So now I'm going to go through the different types of controls that we offer for QNOSTICS. The first one is our Q controls, which are our positive run whole pathogen controls designed to mimic the performance of a patient sample. These are most suitably run as a daily run internal QC. It's a true third party control, so it will give an unbiased assessment of your analytical performance and help your, your laboratories meet regulatory requirements. They're at a single concentration, which is approximately a medium positive. These controls are CE marked. And depending on the pathogen, we offer some high and low positive run controls as well. And these controls are traceable to international reference materials in line with ISO 17511. Then moving on to our molecular Q panels, these are intended to evaluate the assays analytical measuring range and they can be used to support laboratory training and in the assessment and development of molecular diagnostic assays throughout the whole testing process. This is in the format of a panel of concentrations to cover the clinical range and these concentrations again are traceable to international reference materials. Per panel, you will receive four samples, including a high positive, a medium positive, a low positive and a negative sample for contamination. And then we also have our analytical Q panels. Similar to our molecular panels, these cover the range of the assay, but we're looking at the dynamic range this time to allow assessment of linearity, limit of detection and limit of quantitation. So a slightly larger panel, it contains between five and ten samples spanning the dynamic range of the assay in a linear progression. Like with all our controls, it's whole pathogen at a series of concentrations to cover the assay's analytical range. And again, these concentrations are traceable to international reference materials. And then finally, we have our evaluation panel. So these cover a range of genotypes and can be used to evaluate assay characteristics, confirm performance claims and ensure your assay is fit for purpose. This means they can be used in the validation of clinical assays and the development of new diagnostic tests. This is because they allow detection of different genotypes of the pathogens and this is because they're whole pathogen controls. So now I'm going to go into a couple of examples on how um, you can utilize these QNOSTIC panels within um, a molecular laboratory. The example I'm going to use is the Randox Molecular Laboratory, which we are using for SARS-CoV-2. As Bryony introduced, it's one of the largest molecular laboratories um, in the UK and Europe. So how can Randox and QNOSTICs help molecular laboratories? 
Qnostics will offer quality control solutions for all stages of the molecular assay life cycle. So if we start at the beginning with method verification, ensuring the assay fulfills the testing requirements, an evaluation panel can be utilized in this situation to evaluate assay characteristics. Once the method has been verified, we can then move on to laboratories performing method validation. This is where analytical panels can be used to assess for linearity, limit of detection and limit of quantitation. This will also highlight any quality improvements that need to be made before moving on to method implementation. So when a laboratory is using the assay regularly, Q controls slash daily run controls can be used in routine clinical use as internal QC. If internal QC is recovering as expected, then patient results can be reported with confidence. You can also trend internal QC over time to confirm performance consistency and show if any quality improvements need to, need to be made, such as revalidation of an existing assay and to assess to, for batch to batch variation. So now I'm going to go into an example of how we are using our controls in our testing lab. So you can see here I've got an example of a 96 well plate. I'm going to first talk about the extraction controls which are present in well A1 and A2. So most labs will use a nuclease free water as a negative extraction well. This uh, control, this will highlight if there's any contamination in the plate. However, nuclease free water cannot assess any specificity claims. So in our laboratories, once per shift, the Qnostics negative extraction control will be used. This can assess specificity and detect contamination. It is also used to assess KPIs, so key performance indicators, to assess staff training at the beginning of a shift. And then moving on to our PCR controls. Negative controls are always provided with the PCR kit. Again, this is um, nuclease free water to test for contamination. And then there's also a positive PCR control, which has to be purchased separately, usually at a low concentration to detect low viral load. And then finally, we have our internal inbuilt controls. So these are additional primer pairs to target human material and they're contained in the real-time PCR kit to ensure swab integrity and sample quality. So to go into a couple of real life examples, um, this is how we would use Qnostics for quality improvement in our COVID-19 laboratory. So the first one is lot-to-lot -lot assessment of nucleic acid extraction reagents or real-time PCR kits. So control, we would use Q controls to ensure the previous lot of reagents are compa comparable to the new lot of reagent based on the true positive and negative result when assessing multiple SARS-CoV-2 gene targets. And then we have our molecular controls, which can be useful in the clinical validation of equipment, such as nucleic acid extraction platforms and real-time PCR machines. So the clinical validation of equipment can be can use molecular Q panels, and this is because they include a low, medium, high, and a negative sample. It is recommended to perform clinical validation on a routine basis, but particularly after installation of a new machine and after any routine maintenance or repair. And then we also have staff training. So we would make sure to train our staff to determine the prepare accuracy of the trainee. So for our extraction scientists, we will get them to prepare 70 water samples and 20 Qnostic control samples. And if all the water samples come back as undetermined or negative and all the Qnostics controls come back as positive, then the trainee will be deemed competent to conduct the extraction process um, for COVID testing. We also have our analytical Q panels. So like I said, these can be used to assess for linearity, limit of detection and limit of quantitation. It's essential to determine how these parameters can po be positively or negatively affected by changes in the workflow. So this is why using an analytical Q panel regularly is advised. It can ensure that the best quality and performance can be utilized within your lab, resulting in improved accuracy. We also have carried out comparison testing between manual process versus automated liquid handling robot systems. And for this, we used molecular Q panels, again, with our low, medium, high and negative controls. This was used to ensure that crossover contamination from the robotic systems was minimal and in line with the results obtained using a well-established manual protocol and process. 
And then finally, we have our research and development processes. So we used our Qnostics controls in the development of a total nucleic acid extraction kit for SARS-CoV-2. These Qnostics controls we use in the development to test for the limit of detection and sensitivity of the molecular workflow. So just to summarise, why do we recommend to use third party independent controls? They can help monitor the precision of results from test kits and also non-commercial assays or laboratory developed tests. They're aimed at the prevention of errors by constant and consistent monitoring, and they can assess variation between different lots of reagents. They can provide an independent mechanism to ensure that results are reliable. And if used regularly, they can be used to apply a just-in-time corrective action to eliminate any errors during the testing process and prevent the release of patient samples. The whole process controls can be designed to monitor the whole testing process and they're designed to closely mimic the patient sample. So thank you all for listening to me. I'm now going to pass over to um, our guest speaker, Robin from MBS, who's going to present a case study on validating their direct PCR machine using the Qnostic SARS-CoV-2 analytical panel. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Robin Streck. Uh, I've been working as a scientist research and development since about four months uh, at MBS in Goes, the Netherlands. And, uh, First of all, before I get into it, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers at Rendox for inviting us to present our exciting new PCR system and for this opportunity to show some of our data. So uh, just to give you a quick introduction on molecular biology systems. Uh, so the company was founded back in 2015 by our CEO, Gerte Vos, uh, in the Netherlands. And the main uh, core business of the company is the development of a new PCR cycler um, that, uh, due to new technology, allows ultra-fast amplification of nucleotide sequences much faster than conventional PCR. And um, this is possible because the machine contains three heat blocks instead of one heat block. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, I can show that in a little bit more detail. So the main difference between the next-gen PCR thermal cycler and a conventional PCR thermal cycler is the three blocks instead of one blocks being present in the next-gen PCR. So on the left-hand side, you can see an example of a conventional PCR cycler. It has a heat block that can, um, where a microplate uh, with samples can be uh, put on top of, and then uh, this microplate, the temperature is being regulated by the single block uh, through uh, heating up and cooling down this block. Um, then if you look at the graph on the left, left-hand corner, you see that in between the uh, temperature changing from the denaturing step into the annealing step into the extension step uh, in every cycle, there is a temperature uh, fluctuation in between, which is called the ramping time of the reaction. Um, this, own, this does not only uh, cause the reaction to take much longer than is actually necessary, but it also makes it so that the reaction is more variable because not only the target concentrations, uh, the target temperatures are reached in the reaction, but also any intermediary temperatures. So on the right hand side, you can see um, a schematic of our uh, of our thermal cycler, and it actually uses three heat blocks, which are all kept at a constant temperature. So one heat block is at the denaturing temperature of 98 degrees usually. Uh, then the second heat block in the middle is kept at the annealing temperature of the primers. And then the third block is kept constant at the extension temperature of the polymerase. Um, and this uh, fully eliminates the uh, uh, ramp up time within the block uh, due to heating and cooling. Um, so there is, uh, because of the uh, design of our microplates, this is a, a thin uh, polypropylene um, polymer, which is used. Um, there's actually an, a near instant heat transfer from the heating block into the sample volume. Um, and this, so this leads to uh, enormous time savings and, and also more precise amplification. So on the next slide, uh, I've included a movie which shows the system in action. So you can actually see what's going on inside the machine. Um, 
So here you see the three heat blocks and there is a tray where the microplate is put in and this is moved between the three heat blocks and then pressed against the heat blocks. So this both mixes the volume which is in the sample wells uh, and also allows for near instant heat transfer. Um, so uh, optimal thermal dynamics. So uh, this was uh, the development of the system was uh, quite a success. And um, uh, now that we had the machine, we were actually uh, thinking about what this machine could theoretically be used for, right? So in PCR, um, we uh, were looking at applications where uh, where speed is actually the most crucial factor in the in the in the cycling reaction. Uh, so we started working on a couple of applications. So uh, some of these were um, the detection of uh, or the bacterial detection. So for example, E. coli in urinary tract infection patients, but also C. diff uh, screening. Um, we also worked on an application uh, where we generated amplicons of the BRCA1 gene for breast cancer screening. Um, but then by the start of 2019, of course, the COVID pandemic really started um, yeah, uh, ramping up and uh, we, we saw a very nice business opportunity in developing a essay, a PCR essay um, for the detection of COVID-19. And I've, uh, so why is this actually a good idea of running uh, a COVID-19 detection application on a PCR cycler? Uh, you can see that in the graph here. So um, there's uh, basically three different molecules that can be targeted when, uh, or that can be targeted in COVID-19 detection. Uh, so the first of these is the SARS-CoV-2 genome, so the genome genomic RNA, and this is detected by uh, by PCR, so either qPCR or re uh, reverse transcriptase PCR. The second one is uh, based on antigen detection, so this is proteins which are uh, on the outside of a SARS-CoV-2 particle, and the third one is actually measuring the human immune response to COVID. So this is by antibody detection. Uh, so on the graph on the left hand side, you can see uh, uh, the detection potential of these three methods um, plotted against the uh, the, the time frame uh, of the infection within a patient. And you can see actually that PCR and antigen tests are both capable of detecting um, SARS-CoV-2 infection at the very start of infection, even, even before the onset of symptoms. Um, but there is a difference between antigen tests and PCR, and that is that uh, antigen tests, although very rapid and uh, uh, relatively cheap to perform, uh, these are uh, not as accurate as PCR tests. So uh, uh, recent estimations that were made in literature suggest that it's uh, around 70% sensitive. So of course, um, this sensitivity level is, uh, you know, for certain applications will probably be too low because, uh, for example, when you look at large scale screening applications on airports or stadia or theaters, for example, where a test of entry is required for um, for for people to go uh, to go inside the building or to be allowed to travel, uh, you would want to have a uh, essay which is as sensitive as possible. So PCR testing here uh, seems uh, quite a nice approach, uh, although uh, conventional PCR testing is actually uh, quite expensive and it takes several hours at least to perform. So we saw a nice opportunity here because we have this fast PCR cycler that we can actually use PCR testing to detect COVID-2 molecules in asymptomatic uh, people uh, within half an hour or so. So the requirements that we set for ourselves to develop this ultra fast uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, direct PCR detection assay were uh, as follows. So we wanted the assay to be able to um, directly uh, or directly test for SARS-CoV-2 without the need for RNA extraction. So this was both to minimize the necessary steps and also maximize efficiency. Um, um, uh, so and, and then without sacrificing the sensitivity of the essay. Right? So uh, RNA extraction, of course, it takes more time, it takes more resources. Um, uh, so direct testing in samples would be the preferable way. And uh, while looking at these requirements, we also wanted to put an emphasis on the speed of the system. So the time from sampling to result should be as, as short as possible to make it viable for these large scale screening purposes. So then we 
um, started developing uh, an assay to detect SARS-CoV-2 in patient material, and we opted for a, a threeplex PCR, RT-PCR um, assay using endpoint fluorescence measurements. So this is not a quantitative PCR where you measure fluorescence per cycle, but it measures fluorescence at the end of the assay and then can detect whether SARS-CoV-2 material is present in the sample or not. So of these three targets, two of them were directed against the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, so the advantages of using a dual target uh, design where we target two different genes in the SARS-CoV-2 genome um, was to both increase sensitivity. So uh, if one of the primers uh, were somehow not able to create an amplicon as well as the other, you would also you would always get a nice and high uh, fluorescent signal. But also because we target two genes in a, in uh, in SARS-CoV-2, it makes it so that uh, when there is a SARS-CoV-2 strain that has a mutation in one of the target genes at the site where the primers anneal, um, our uh, method is actually resistant to not being able to amplify a fragment there because we target two genes. And then the third uh, gene in the assay was an internal control. So this was to confirm PCR cycling efficiency and also uh, detect the present of, uh, presence of human genomic DNA. So um, we targeted the uh, RNHP locus uh, in, in human genomic DNA. So uh, whenever we get a signal in the Sci5 channel, so this is one of the fluorescent channels in the detector, you can verify that sampling went correctly and that there's uh, actually human material present in the reaction. So here is an overview of our workflow. It's quite simple. Uh, so the first step is uh, sampling of uh, patient material. So this could both be uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, but also saliva, although this is an experimental method. So uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, uh, we have uh, a little bit more data on. Um, this swab is inserted, inserted into a tube that contains uh, a viral transfer media medium. In, in our case, we uh, mostly use uh, Amy's liquid for this. Um, so then this Amy's liquid material with clinical material is transferred to a heat block and inactivated at 98 degrees for 10 minutes. So this is both to lyse uh, cells to uh, free up the RNA and genomic DNA for PCR cycling um, and also to inactivate the virus. So this ensures the safety of the, uh, the technician that is handling the sample. Um, then these heat inactivated samples are transferred to a MBS microplate um, and combined with uh, the reagents within our uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, detection kit. Um, and it's then sealed with a, a clear heat seal on a heat sealer. Uh, so this is only takes uh, one and a half seconds at 165 degrees. And then the seal plate is transferred to our next gen PCR machine for thermal cycling. Um, so in the reaction, um, I will get to that in the next slide, uh, but there is both a reverse transcription uh, prior to PCR cycling and then uh, 50 cycles of PCR which can be completed within uh, within half an hour. And after PCR cycling, finally, the plate is then transferred into a microplate reader, which can read fluorescence both in the uh, FAM channel, which is for the SARS-CoV-2 targets, but also in the Sci-5 channel, which is for the internal control. So we can distinguish these uh, signals. So here you see an overview of the PCR protocol. So the reverse transcription takes um, around uh, six minutes. And then after that, there is a, a PCR cycling, um, twofold PCR cycling uh, protocol where there is an initial amplification of five cycles, which has a longer annealing time um, and also a longer denaturing time. So this is to really allow uh, efficient amplification within the first cycles of the reaction and then the 45 cycles after that. So the, the main uh, part of the PCR program is actually uh, uh, optimized to be as short as possible to allow for a short amplification time. So for in terms of validation strategy, uh, we wanted this. Uh, we wanted to uh, sort of uh, perform as many studies as we could, of course, with this system. And uh, so the strategy that we adhere to here was a three-step validation protocol. Um, just getting back uh, to what Heidi just told us, uh, these steps roughly followed the 
the order of first doing uh, a scientific validity report. Uh, so that's step one. So we did some measurements in synthetic SARS-CoV-2 RNA to determine the feasibility of the assay and also the linearity. Uh, step two was to look at analytical performance. So for this, we used a QNOSTICS analytical Q panel. Um, so this uh, simultaneously uh, determines the limit of detection and also the limit of quantification in uh, in surrogate clinical samples. So this was a nice intermediary step to the final study where we checked clinical performance. And uh, this was done in collaboration with a hospital in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. So for the first step, we um, looked at feasibility. So for this, we did triplicate measurements of SARS-CoV-2 synthetic RNA uh, in a uh, logarithmic dilution series. So this was, uh, we started with a uh, the highest concentration of samples at 10,000 copies SARS-CoV-2 material per microliter of sample, and then did then tenfold dilutions all the way down to 0.1 copy, uh, SARS-CoV-2 copy per microliter. And we used for this two dilution media for this sample. So we looked at nuclease free water, but also at Amy's viral transfer medium, because this is the medium that we recommend for use in uh, clinical samples. So and uh, on the right hand side of the graph, you can see two lines. So the blue line is the um, uh, the fluorescence measurements in the FUM channel. So for the SARS-CoV-2 targets in nuclease free water and then the red line is the the same dilution series made in amy's vtm so here you can see that amy's vtm actually performs really nicely as compared to uh, nuclease free water um, and this was good for us to see because this also shows that this particular vtm does not contain any pcr inhibitors so the cycling can be done efficiently and also linearly um, so on the bottom left hand side of this plot, you can see the signal for the internal control targets, so the Psi 5 channel. And there you can see that very nicely there is no amplification of RNASP, so no amplification of human material in samples where there is only SARS CoV 2 material present. Uh, and we only saw signal in the positive control. So this also shows uh, specificity of the, um, of the RNASP primers. So then moving on to the second uh, study in the QNOSTICS uh, analytical panel, um, we uh, obtained a, a SARS-CoV-2 analytical Q panel uh, from QNOSTICS, and this contains nine samples, which range from 1 million to 50 uh, SARS-CoV-2 particles per milliliter of sample. And we uh, ran these samples in triplicate using the direct PCR protocol that we uh, also used for the previous study. So uh, direct PCR meaning there's no nucleic extraction or additional heating steps. Uh, so we just took these samples from the freezer and ran PCR directly on them. And on the next slide, you can see the results from the Q panel. Uh, so on, on the left hand side in the graph, you can see uh, the triplicate measurements for each of the uh, dilution steps. So on the very left hand side, there is the positive control and then sample one, two, three, four, five, and so on until sample nine, you can see a nice uh, uh, linear sort of detection limit. So we were able to actually um, detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 material all the way down to one copy per microliter of sample. So this is sample SO5. Um, and this detection limit was nice to see for us because it, it's also the detection limit that is recommended or required by the MHRA in their target product profile for SARS-CoV-2 detection methods. So we are right there at the, uh, uh, at the uh, desired sensitivity, uh, basically. Um, and then uh, the internal control target uh, was also detectable in each of these samples because they do contain human material. Um, one interesting thing to see here is that in the samples where there is a high concentration of SARS-CoV-2, there is actually a lower signal of RNAs P. Um, and we think that this has to do with uh, competition for PCR reagents within the reaction. So when there is a very high concentration of SARS-CoV-2, uh, this will uh, uh, use uh, a lot of the PCR reagents in each cycle. So the RNASP signal will be lower than in samples with a lower SARS-CoV-2 concentration. Um, this does, however, not not lead to uh, RNASP not being able to be detected, of course. So. 
And then for the third part of this three-step validation protocol, we uh, obtained a class, uh, clinical sample set of uh, 87 nasopharyngeal swab samples from our collaborators at the Canisius Wilhelmina Hospital in Nijmegen. So of these patient samples, 64 were tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 and 23 were tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 uh, using their in-house validated qPCR method looking at the e-gene, expression of the e-gene. Um, we also included a number of controls in this experiment, so 17 non-template controls where Amy's, uh, only Amy's liquid was used as a sample, and then six non-template controls where only water was used, and three positive controls where a uh, N-gene plasmid of the SARS-CoV-2 genome was included to, um, yeah, to use as a positive control. <laughs> So first, we compared the outcomes of our next-gen PCR system with the outcomes of the qPCR system, uh, and that you can see plotted here. So on the y-axis, you see fluorescence in our next-gen PCR system, and on the x-axis, you see the CT value for the e-gene. And uh, with this data, we were actually able to show a high degree of linearity between these two techniques. So uh, the correlation between these two data sets was uh, over 0.80, uh, and, and 0.80 is sort of used as a cutoff to uh, identify high correlation between two data sets. Um, so this basically means that whenever there is a, a low CT value in a sample for the e-gene, there is a high fluorescence level on our system and also vice versa. So whenever there's a high CT value for the e-gene, there was a low fluorescent signal. Um, so, of course, this uh, linearity was good to see, but the logical next step would be to actually see whether both whether both methods uh, agree in terms of sample calling. So we did, uh, as a final experiment, we performed a uh, clinical percent agreement scoring analysis on the next slide. Um, and uh, you can see the results from that here. So. Um, we were able to show that SARS-CoV-2 sequences were detected in uh, all positive samples identified as positive by the reference methods, and then also in one out of 23 negative samples. So one sample showed an increase in fluorescence where there was a, an uh, undetermined CT um, cycle. Um, so, and then the RNASP uh, sequences, we were able to detect in 85 out of 87 samples. Um, and we think the reason for us that we were uh, that we missed two of these samples, and so these two samples that were missed were both positive for SARS-CoV-2. So this relates to um, what I told you just now about the competition for PCR reagents. So we think that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, concentration uh, in these samples were, uh, was uh, was very high, so that the RNASP was not able to be amplified quite uh, quite quite as nicely, right? Um, and then when you uh, uh, when you put these uh, findings uh, in a two by two table, so uh, determining uh, in what percentage of samples both methods agree that it, that it is a positive sample, and then also uh, where mm. both methods agree that it is a negative negative samples, you can uh, determine clinical sensitivity. So this is indicated by the positive percent agreement score of 98.5 percent, and then the clinical specificity of the assay. So the negative percent agreement score was 100 uh, percent. So to conclude uh, the data, um, so first of all, we are able to show the feasibility of our SARS-CoV-2 detection system using uh, next-gen PCR in a direct RT-PCR protocol. And uh, the QNOSTIC SARS-CoV-2 analytical Q-panel was actually very helpful for us in validating um, uh, validating our assay. So uh, uh, the way I see it is that this uh, uh, solution provided by Rendox is actually uh, a nice stepping stone in between measurements in synthetic material uh, as compared to clinical material. And it allows you to uh, first look at limit of detection and limit of quantification before you move on into real clinical samples in, uh, in assay development. Um, and uh, so our, our SARS-CoV-2 detection method is, uh, is is characterized by a very high performance metrics actually in terms of speed. So there's only 27 minutes of cycling time as compared to uh, to several hours using qPCR. Uh, while the performance was uh, pretty much equal and uh, and the costs are also quite low. So so this makes our system a very nice option for uh, large scale screening purposes. 
So I would like to conclude with uh, um, some acknowledgements. So I would like to thank everyone at uh, MBS, the team of MBS in uh, in Goes. Um, also thanks to Isogen Life Sciences, which is our QNOSIX distributor. Um, big thanks to Canisius Wilhelmina Hospital for providing clinical samples and helping with the analysis. And finally, uh, Rendox for um, uh, providing the QNOSIX uh, panel and uh, allowing me to uh, to speak here and uh, and show off our system. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm very curious to hear about uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.